Hello and welcome to another episode of Tech of the Month, the video series where we bring you the latest, greatest and often downright weirdest tech to make its way through the Bike Radar offices. And good news, this month we have another jam-packed video to feast your eyes on. Liam is here with a cost-cutting tip to help you make some energy drink at home. Kai has Insta360's latest Go 3 action camera. Jack Luke has some baffling bamboo handlebars. And there's a stunning Yeti that you should definitely keep an eye out for. But before we get to any of that, let's go back in time through the power of editing where I bring you a little closer look at SRAM's new GX Eagle transmission. In what's becoming a bit of a regular feature for Tech of the Month, I'm here with yet more delectable drivetrain tech, or in this case, transmission tech. Yes, it's taken less than two months for SRAM's Eagle transmissions to filter down to a more affordable level with the launch of this new GX Eagle transmission earlier this month. I know, I know, we've already covered it in a dedicated video, but it's such hot property I just had to give you all another quick look. Of course, the big thing here is the rear derailleur, with its direct full mount design, but also the new battery placement. The direct mount fitting means you need a bike with SRAM's UDH or Universal Derailleur Hanger interface to fit it, so sadly I won't be strapping this onto my transition spur. This makes me very sad. <sighs> It does mean that those fortunate enough to have a compatible bike will be treated to breezy installation with not an adjustment screw in sight. Back to the battery, and this now sits in the full mount struts rather than on the rear like other transmission derailleurs. SRAM claims this is to provide better protection for the battery, though I do think that the battery retention clip is a little bit more vulnerable now, so be careful with it as though it's budget, it's not cheap. The whole group set, as you see it here, costs £1,180 or $1,300. So while this is cheaper than XO Transmission I featured a few episodes ago, it is still a chunky outlay. What isn't so chunky is the pod controller, which is shared with the other transmissions, though it is the standard rather than the ultimate version that I have here that is used, so it uses fixed rather than modular buttons. The handlebar clamping options are the same though. Also the same are the cassette's gear ratios. It uses a 10 to 52 tooth spread and closer spacing at the bottom end with 38, 44 and 52 tooth cogs. In order to cut costs, the construction is different with SRAM's pin dome technology featuring for gears one through eight, where the cogs are pinned rather than machined in a single piece. The remaining gears, however, are a single piece construction. Last but by no means least is the chain with its flat top design working with the cassette's full X-Sync design and shift lanes to shift better the harder you pedal. You'll have to watch our first ride video if you want to find out if it stacks up to that claim. Action cameras have been putting viewers at the heart of the action for years now. Insta360 is one brand that's been pushing the boundaries of what these little marvels can do. As a videographer here at Bike Radar, this new Insta360 GO 3 is a really exciting new tool for me. This tiny camera weighs in at only 35 grams and is small enough to chuck in your pocket, a hip pack, even a tool roll, and should be great for filming whilst out riding. However, one of the main changes with this new model is the case that is now included, or Action Pod as they call it. Unlike the previous GO 2 version, this new case is packed full of features. The camera slots in and allows you to see what you're shooting via a touch operated screen. You can even flip the screen around to the front for you vloggers out there. This casing also improves battery life by a claim 50% and you can use the screen as an external monitor, which is pretty cool. It's claimed to have upgraded audio with two built-in microphones and is IPX8 waterproof up to 16 feet in its smaller form or IPX4 splash proof in this case. It can shoot 2.7K at up to 30 FPS and 120 FPS slow-mo in 1080p but on SAD's report, there's no 4K option. Given the size of the camera and the unique ways you could shoot with it, I'm interested to see how badly I'll miss that higher resolution. The GO 3 uses a magnet system to attach to various mounts, which is impressively strong and makes it quick and easy to move between the mounts. Included in the box is a pivot stand, which has a sticky pad on the bottom, a clip, which I reckon you could fit on the peak of a hat, and this magnet pendant, which provides an easy option for chest mounting. 
Something to note is that the only storage option is the built-in storage, which comes in three sizes, 32, 64 and 128 gigabyte. This does simplify things, but removes the flexibility that SD cards allow. In terms of price, the base 32GB model comes in at £379.99 in pounds and US dollars, and the top end 128GB model will set you back £429.99 again in pounds and US dollars. This camera will be super useful on our own shoots where we'll often quickly switch from chest to handlebar mounts, which can be a bit trickier with other brands of camera. I'm excited to add this little camera to our arsenal, so stay tuned to see what we can do with it. Now it's time to head over to Jack for some funky handlebars. We now move on to something truly weird and wonderful. Now you will of course be familiar with carbon and aluminium handlebars. And we've even featured a set of titanium handlebars on a previous episode of Tech of the Month. But have you heard of bamboo handlebars? These laminated bamboo handlebars from New Zealand based Pashier, and I'm so sorry, I've definitely pronounced your name wrong, are claimed to be the most comfortable handlebars you could possibly have for commuting and trekking. Compared to aluminium, carbon and even titanium, wood offers natural damping qualities which, in the words of the brand, should make for a very comfortable ride. The bars are only rated for trekking, commuting and touring, so sort of like all-round day-to-day riding, but safe to say these are not the sort of thing you should expect to fit to your shred-ready mountain bike. Instead, for pleasant pootling around town in style, these could add some additional comfort to the front end of your bike. These are the Gump 760 bars, which, as the name suggests, they are 760 millimeters wide. They weigh 390 grams on our scales, and if these aren't to your tastes with a little bit of back sweep, there are also a flat bar option and an option with slightly less sweep. The bars feature a standard 31.8 millimeter clamping area with a carbon plate placed over that, so you're not clamping directly onto bamboo. Now the bars feature a really nice glossy finish and I urge you to withhold your judgment on these. They are honestly a really premium feeling product in the hand. And that's reflected in the price with these coming in at 170 pounds. Now that is a lot of money for any set of handlebars, let alone a set that's only really designed for touring and trekking. Nonetheless, for those of you that are trying to curate the perfect, earthy, artisan, urban, forager aesthetic on the front end of your bike, these could be for you. And now we go to an altogether more sensible product from Tom. If you've watched this far, then well done. And now you are in for a treat. This is the Yeti SB135 and it's simply so stunning, I just had to show you. But before I go into the finer details, you might have noticed that this bike is not actually a mullet wheel bike or even a full 29er. It's sporting a 27.5 inch wheel setup front and rear to go with its 135 millimeters of switch infinity suspension. What do you think of this smaller wheeled setup? I've got a feeling this is gonna be a hoot to ride, so be sure to let me know what you think in the comments. This is the LRT3 model and it has a 160mm Fox 36 fork up front. To break that name down, LR means this is the lunch ride model, which is based on the bikes that Yeti employees use on their lunchtime rides. T3 means the bike uses Yeti's Turk series carbon, which means it's lighter but is a lot more expensive. To go with the Berlier fork, you've got some Berlier tyres as well, with a Maxxis Asagai Exo Plus up front, teamed with a Minion DHR Exo Plus out back. This is rather than the lighter Exo, Minion, DHF and Recon that you get on the standard builds. Of course though, it's the frame that is the centrepiece of any Yeti. I mean, just look at this stunning frame. While the Switch Infinity system does look similar to the older SB140 with its 27.5 inch wheels, the cartridge bearings now reside in the linkage rather than in the frame. This should make frame servicing that little bit easier when the time comes. The two-piece shock extender moves the rear shock forward in the frame. Yeti says this is to help optimize the suspension kinematics as well as reducing standover height, improving shock compatibility and giving more space for the all-important water bottle. Neater details include SRAM's UDH hanger interface, which means the bike is compatible with SRAM's new transmissions like the Exo fitted to this bike. 
And praise the heavens, there's finally a threaded bottom bracket rather than a press fit unit, so mechanics everywhere can rejoice. The cables also don't go through the headset, as is the trend at the moment for a lot of bikes, but are instead routed through the frame with these clamped ports. This should mean that they are rattle free during your rides. Naturally, of course, all this carbon fiber, Kashima loveliness and wireless trickery does not come cheap. This bike costs £9,799 or $9,500, so you're going to have to have deep pockets to swing a leg over it. This bike is in for test for our technical editor Tom Marvin, though hopefully he'll be able to let it out of his grip for long enough for me to give it a little pedal and see what the fuss is all about. As ever, if you want to know what Tom thinks of this wonderful little bike, be sure to check out the full review on bikeradar.com in a few weeks' time. If you want to ride faster, you'll need to supply a lot of energy to your system. Now, usually we do this with carbohydrate rich products. And while the old mark of around 60 grams of carbs per hour is fine for a more leisurely ride, the pros have been pushing to well over 100 grams per hour. Drink mixes such as Morton 320 and Science in Sports Beta Fuel mix maltodextrin with fructose to allow your body to absorb more carbs per hour. They do a very good job and they taste okay too. But they can get expensive, so what can you do? Well, if you boil these products down to the basics, they're mixing our friends maltodextrin and fructose together in a ratio of 1 to 0.8. So for every gram of the former, you have 0.8 grams of the latter. Simple. We've also got to get some salt to make sure that we replace what we lose. Now this drink mix gives us 110 grams of carbs in a single bottle. Now I actually got this maltodextrin in a five kilo bag from my protein for just £2.61. A kilo bag of fructose powder actually cost me £6.84. Fill it up with water and there you have it, 110 grams of carbs with hydration. I actually wonder if this is the cheapest product that we've ever featured. So Beta Fuel costs £2.75 per serving. Morton 320 is £3 and 7 pence. This is about 47p. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode of Tech of the Month. If you want to see more, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, keep an eye on bikeradar.com, and if you want to see even more of the latest tech, then why not check out this wonderful video.